There's like an actual song I know that sounds just like this, and for whatever reason, I can't quite get to what it is. Uh oh. I'm done. Are you worried about Wow. I just heard myself too. I don't know what that is. Hey, everybody. Uh, I'm here because I want to be here. And uh, so evidently is Paul. So welcome to Because I Want to here on the line. Myself and Paul and Gia are here to take your calls and discuss a variety of topics that we will tend to favor apologetics. Um, and by the way, if uh, if you're interested in apologetics, if you have a position that you'd like to to challenge someone on we're starting a new show called inboss which i'll talk about a little bit later but you can go to q in a line.com slash i think it's slash inboss but if you just go to q in a line.com there's a link there where you can apply to be on uh inboss it's gonna it's gonna be as often as we need to do it as often as we get qualified people to participate so welcome everybody and before we get into the discussions i have to mention on today's show we're also running a contest kind of and a related poll so first the contest i have been challenged someone offered to donate 100 dollars if i could go an entire show without telling someone or telling anybody to shut up um i agreed to do this although i did say i thought it was fucking stupid that person then agreed to offer up an additional 400 dollars if we would post a poll asking you to vote on whether or not you think it's fucking stupid to pay somebody to not tell people to shut up. Now, we're going to get the money no matter how you vote. So you don't have to agree with me in order to support the line. You don't have to, you know, if you if you hate me and don't want to support the line, voting no or yes isn't going to change that at all. It's just get your thoughts in as to whether or not, uh, what you think about it. The poll is now up in chat. Um, moderators and other people i may remind people throughout the show um what i th or, or what we're voting on but other than that i'm not going to poison the well at all i don't i don't want to i think it's weird to have people make a decision on something when we haven't really had a discussion about what i meant by it or what they meant by it but that's okay because this is the, this is the poll and it serves to help out the line so if you are a potential caller, if you're someone who'd like to call in and chat with us, the number is 720-619-2288. There's also a link in the, in the description below to call in via web. And now that all of the initial overhead stuff uh, is done, hey, man, how you doing? I'm doing well. I'm just now imagining that really we should start a fund. Maybe I'll start a GoFundMe that I will tell someone to shut up if, <laughs> if, if enough <laughs> money is donated. Because that would be the opposite of what I, what I would normally do. Hey, good we to see you on a Monday yeah, night. Not a normal, not a normal time for the for us, yeah. but this is great because we wanna. What's new yeah. in the world of skepticism, Matt? Um, you know, I'm really not sure what's new in the world of skepticism. Um, it's I tell you what, you know, I remember there was a period of time where um, conventions were hot and heavy, and not just atheist conventions, but there were always uh, skeptic gatherings and i used to go to the amazing meeting um of course now that randy is dead uh i i don't know that that community is as thriving as it was before but hey if somebody there knows and and uh has information i'd love to participate it's just i haven't had time to go to conventions for fun in in a while and then with the uh the backstreet boys reunion tour uh keeping us locked in our house for a couple of years here um things are a little a little bit different uh by the way one of the things that paul and i talked about beforehand is whether or not uh he could tell people to shut up and uh, i, I we, we kind of well he can do whatever he wants but we're not going to try to to get around it by doing that <laughs> um we had a caller and um oh it's been terminated now i see why uh oh right off the bat a manual was calling in to evidently apologize for irritating me yesterday and uh considering i banned him and don't won't take any more of his calls um i accept your apology but it's not going to change anything forgive but do not forget sometimes yeah it's i mean we've we've had a bunch of go arounds and, and honestly i think part of the reason uh, that i don't plan to take any more calls from him specifically is i don't think that he's i genuinely don't think that he's getting anything out of the calls and I'm not sure that the calls are benefiting anybody else. I'd like him just to to keep watching and see how similar conversations happen with 
other people because yesterday the the, the key thing was this uh, assertion that lust is a sin now I, mm. I don't care what somebody says is or isn't a sin um i don't I, sin is this notion of potentially uh, being able to wound a god or violating what a god thinks etc right. you know what i care about is the consequences of that action and and whether or not it harms people and no matter how we try to do it he would go from lust is uh, it, it's it's wrong because it will hurt the person who's lusting because they will then feel guilty. And I'm like, I don't feel guilty for lust. I don't. And and the whole world, it's like, it's it's like uh, when you're going through the Ten Commandments and you get down to thou shalt, thou shalt not covet. And I'm like, covet is absolutely what makes the world go around. Trying to keep up absolutely. with the Joneses, it, it is at least a capitalist sense. But merely saying, I want to live a better life and I see somebody else living a better life, uh, covetousness doesn't mean that you're going to take immoral actions. Just like yesterday when we were trying to discuss lust, he was trying to suggest that it would lead to sexual assault. Well, sure, it's entirely possible that someone um, engaged in lust could then go on to sexually assault someone on it. But, you know... That's like saying somebody who gets behind the wheel of a car could drive it through the front of a 7-Eleven, but that doesn't mean that driving a car is bad. Or at least starting your ignition, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. If you well, started the car, yeah. Or if you thought about having a car, that, that might be <laughs> a good car to do it. But All right, I, what have you me, been doing? Let me step. Well, I need to, for one, oh, deal with the puppy. One sec. Yeah, no, no worries. By the way, that you, if you hear a cat whining, evidently there's a cat in heat uh, in addition to the puppy that Paul's dealing with. Let me talk a little bit about what's going on on the line over the next week. While we, Oh, he's back already. But tomorrow night is a new episode of Dying Out Loud with Dave Warnock featuring Aaron Lewis. On Wednesday night's Hang Up, I will be back with um, Apostasy on uh, the Hang Up on Wednesday. Thursday will be Katie and Dr. Ben um, on the Transatlantic Colin Show. And next Sunday will be Myself and Jimmy, Jimmy will be back from, I don't know, whatever loafing vacation type thing he's doing. Um, he'll be back on Wednesday for a normal. And next week's Skep Talk on Monday will be uh, John Gleason, the godless engineer, with a special guest. So that's all of that. So welcome back from your puppy excursion. Did that quest go well? I can't hear you now. I muted myself so that the dog noises wouldn't happen in there. <laughs> yeah, that's this is we're professionals, right? This is I do what I do for a living, apparently. The uh, uh, the thing that I've been noticing a lot of late, uh, both in my professional life, because you know YouTube is now my weirdly my profession, uh, which is a weird thing to say when you have adult children, but also uh, in the world of apologetics, is that everyone's just freaking out about AI. Yeah. So that's that's the new that's the new trend is is AI mark of the beast? Can we use literally some some pastors have been caught uh, doing using Chat GPT making their sermons? How do you catch uh, them? Which well, is it because the sermon's too uh, good? <laughs> probably, it's one of those things. Of course, you can you can tell these uh, large language models to actually like you can rerun the script and like say remove any markers that it was generated by an A, like you can just keep iterating over it. So it eventually fools everything. Yeah, this AI's just got uh, got everyone panicked. And, you know, does this chat GPT have a soul and all these kind of fun new things for apologists to talk about? But for yeah, me, these are uh, tools. I, I love yeah. them uh, as as toys and tools and getting my job done faster in a lot of times and ways. So I'm excited. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. We're, we got calls starting to come in and we're not quite ready to take them i jimmy and i talked about the ai stuff and i will say that initially uh, my interactions with like chat gpt which i don't truly really consider to be ai in in a strong sense um but i wasn't all that impressed it was you know hey we, we tried a number of different things right um a, a debate in the style of this or uh, evaluate mm -hmm. this particular debate between so and so or what argument would somebody make and it can do a good job of emulating some people sometimes and i have seen some poetry that it produced and maybe it 
it speaks to the fact that I, I mean, I love poetry in, in within music. I'm not, I don't just sit around and like read, read poetry. Uh, but I think it's, it's simpler yet clever. And I think something like chat GPT is fairly good at that. Jimmy was using it to create prompts for other sort of AI things to mm. generate images. Yeah. And yeah, for sure, I've watched people have it write games and mm -hmm. it can put together a, a like a data structure you know, controls, write something for, you know, Unreal Engine 5 or whatever you're doing. And it seems to me like this is a great tool to do most of the drudgery work for me and let me go back and yeah. edit its code to find out, oh, well, no, we needed to do it this way or you you neglected this or whatever else. Um, I I like it. I just, it, when it, when people first started pointing to ChatGPT, it was a lot of, oh my gosh, this is going to either destroy the world or this is, you, you can't tell it's not a human. And I'm like, well, I, I can tell it's not me. I like, you know. Right. Some some of the callers to the show, you you you're not necessarily sure how much they understand. And when it comes to Chat GPT, I don't think it understands anything. I will say it's the best predictive text type thing I, I've seen so far, and is really functional. Yeah. I use it for all kinds of things. Uh, you know, one of the things I'm starting to use it for is the new Photoshop came out with it, and I'm starting to use it for some of my art uh, on my channel, where where you know something's weirdly cropped and all of a sudden it can create a new shoulder on Jordan Peterson for me, which I did earlier today. Um, but when people are complaining to me, well, you know, isn't this going to put artists out of work? It's like, literally I do all the art on my channel from scratch, like with pen and paper. <laughs> so like I'm the artist that I'm putting out of work. So I'm okay with, you know, in, in making my own life easier and faster. That, that is a really interesting take on it because we were using it to create prompts for, I've forgotten the name of the utility. Um, Probably Mid Journey. It, Jimmy uses Mid Journey, Mid -Journey a lot. maybe. Or, yeah. Yep. I wanted to say Wayfinder, which is a new MMO that's coming out next month because mm. that's stuck in my head. But yeah, Mid Journey. And we were using it to try to make, you know, logos of uh, for Epic Loot Exotics and stuff like that. And we had already, I think we, we've paid two different people to come up with logos for Epic Loot Exotics. And despite uh, paying, I don't think we got what we're really looking for at all. We just got something that was like, okay, we'll take that and run. With it. And right off the bat, when we uh, used uh, ChatGPT to come up with prompts for mid journey, we got some really cool stuff that changed what we thought we wanted. And while we still don't have, uh, haven't finished and, and said, you know, hey, hey, here's the new official logo, um, I, I plan to just, like, once I get done with, with video work and other stuff for the month and I'm, and I'm prepping the magic show for the Seco Student Lines, I plan to sit around and try to come up with as many different uh, logos derived from the ones we already liked as possible. And I don't think that it's going to put any artists out of business because we had already tried to hire, we already did hire somebody to do it, but we can take the thing that we like that's, you know, uh, mid journey generated and give that to an exactly. artist to say, we want this changed in this way. Um, exactly. And, and, and any good, we, we any we all good logo editors. design artist, if you're, if you're a logo design artist in this one and you're not getting ideas and inspired by this, like then you are, gonna lose your you're gonna lose your job to someone who's using ai not to ai you know yeah. these well, you have to use the best tools available to you so anyway it's uh it's just fun to see that kind of story bleeding over into almost everything these days well we we might be able to get into that a bit more i want to make sure that we take callers because you're on the line and all the programs on the line are going to be calling to some extent including uh, in boss, although we also have the line X and there will be additional programs and ways to shift things around just a little bit, but we have Pedro friends or he, him in Australia, uh, who has a question for us. So welcome, Pedro. How are you doing? Thank you, Matt. How are you? I'm doing all right. That's good to hear. Uh, sorry. I didn't get the name of the other host. It's Paul. Paul. It's Paul. Ah, Paul Gia. Beautiful. How are you, Paul? I'm good. I'm slightly muted because the dog is barking, but carry on. <laughs> uh, yeah, my question is 
fairly simple. I have been watching the show Adrian? for maybe 10 years. Yes. Can you hear me now? I'm sorry, I'm sorry Pedro. Could, could you maybe move the phone slightly away from your mouth? It's kind of overdriving the mic and it's crackling and hot. Is it better now? A little bit. It's still pretty hot. Uh, maybe I should take out of my ear plug and put the phone in my head. Ooh. Is this is this better? Well, we're getting more background noise, but I can hear you more clearly. So let's try this. Beautiful. Uh, so yeah, I've been watching the show for maybe ten years now. I uh, really appreciate what you guys do. Uh, and my question is something you've said before that uh, religious people see as shouldn't be uh, called stupid or dumb. Uh, it's their beliefs. It's their uh, dissonant, cognitive dissonance. That oh, hello. Yes. Every time I, my phone goes uh, to lock screen, you lose my voice. I have to pay attention to that. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, so if we use the same standards for anything else that is not religious beliefs, uh, we would call someone stupid for believing irrational things. But with religious beliefs, we hold back on that. And I wonder why. Well, um, I think Paul and I were getting ready to say exactly the same thing. So you do it. Well, I, I wouldn't call someone stupid who believes in flat earth or QAnon or any number of things that I consider to be false or to be, or crystals or whatever. Like I, I was a theist up until just a few years ago, five years ago or so I was still believed all that stuff. And I didn't get one IQ point smarter when I stopped believing what I got was new information. And some of my, uh, the faulty ways I was thinking were corrected and I learned better epistemology, but I do not consider the people who have less information or faulty epistemology to be stupid. So I would, I would not do that. It's not constructive to, to uh, conversations. And so I guess I, it's just, it, uh, I don't buy the premise necessarily. And I, um, while I've seen people on both sides of any argument call the other stupid, uh, I don't know that people necessarily advocate for that. So I'm I'm not buying the premise necessarily, and I'll let Matt carry on to see if that was what he was wanting to say. Yeah, I'm I'm pretty much in the same boat. While while I'm sure that I have in fact called someone stupid or dumb at some point um, for believing something that's irrational, I tend to reserve that for when they believe something um, that they're advocating for that is harmful and problematic. Not merely, hey, I'm. I'm, I, ro I have a belief that somebody thinks is wrong. And so, and the reason that, that I generally suggest that we don't do that, even if I have broken my own rule at some point, is that, well, similar to what Paul was saying, uh, my IQ didn't go up when I stopped believing either. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's gone down because we know that it does that over time. But it, it's really about, strategic thinking in a way and that is there are lots of things that i can say to someone who believe has an irrational set of beliefs um i i have no problem at all pointing out that their beliefs are irrational that their beliefs are harmful that their beliefs um may be viewed as you know stupid dumb you know as a colloquialism but that doesn't mean that i'm assessing the person because the truth is, I have never met anyone in my entire life who's incapable of being wrong and being stupidly wrong, like wrong about in, in a way where people might tend to call call it stupid. I've done tons, tons of stupid things. I did I did stupid things this morning, I, you know. And and by that I mean not just in the sense of believing something irrational, but making a, a a serious error when i ought to know better when i do know better um i sliced my hand open with my pressure washer a couple weeks ago because in haste and wanting to you know hurry through the task i just raised up the tub that i was cleaning and, and then raised up the pressure washer to, to get a, a a stubborn little spot 
and my hand just slipped. Why on earth would you, you know, it's like, why would you aim a gun at somebody uh, just playing around? That that sort of thing is stupid. And and that's that's what I tend to view is, is this sort of kind of uh, dangerous, careless, not just I believe there's a God or I believe in ghosts or I believe in astrology or whatever else. I, I have friends and family members who have all kinds of absolutely ridiculous, irrational beliefs, um, but they as a person aren't necessarily stupid for believing them, which is why I would generally avoid saying that. Got, gotcha. Uh, but my question is, so I'll use the example you did for the pressure washer where you cut, cut your hand by putting it in front of it. I will assume that you will probably not repeat the same act willingly. It might happen in an accident, but I don't think you will do the same thing over and over again because you know the outcome of it. So I'll take an example of the virgin birth. We know well enough human biology and our reproduction system, how it all works, to know that our own species. You, you just went silent again. Oh, sorry. Uh, Where did you lose me? Well, shortly Can after virgin now? birth. Yes. Ah, uh, yeah. So the virgin birth, uh, for me, it's, I'll, I'll call it stupid just for the sake of the argument. For me, it's really stupid for any woman who understands the bio biology of their own bodies, who every month have nature stating to them how their biology works to believe in a virgin birth. For me, that is the definition of stupid. You have the evidence being rubbed in your face every month for how your biology works, but you still believe in something that does not align with that reality. In in my vision, that's what I call stupid. Maybe I'm wrong there. Okay, so first of all, you're, it seems, let me make sure that I'm understanding what you're saying. You're saying that a woman who's constantly reminded of how her body works would be stupid to believe that a virgin birth is possible. Yes. How did you determine that a virgin birth is impossible? Because we have observed it in reptiles and um, at least, if, if, if I may be mistaken, but at least in one instance in mammals. And so in addition, the virgin birth isn't saying, hey, um, parthenogenesis occurred through a normally natural process. It's claiming that a God who can create life made someone pregnant what makes it what makes what about a woman's body makes it stupid to believe that god could do that well taking into that root god can do anything according to the to, to the bible and the dogmas and everything uh i would scrap that because not i believe none of us believes in that. If we use our own biology and as far as we understand our own uh, reproduction system, our species is unable to reproduce without, you know, a partner, as far as we know. Well, see, that's the thing. As far as we know, first of all, as I was just saying, you haven't proven that parthenogenesis is impossible. But the Bible story isn't advocating for parthenogenesis. It's advocating for a miracle. Now, I don't believe that it happened, but I think it's a mistake to claim that it's not possible. And if you're going to engage in arguments with apologists, if your position is miracles are simply not possible, then there's nothing they can ever say that will prove it. And what you've done is you've demonstrated that you don't have an understanding of epistemology that would allow you to become convinced if they were to present evidence for it. You've, de you've determined that because we haven't demonstrated X is possible, that that means that X is impossible. And that's a fallacious line of reasoning. Why isn't that stupid? I don't hear anything. Oh, Petros my gosh. Gone on lock. 
We we seem to completely lost Pedro. Well, I, let's uh -oh. you let's you and I continue hashing this out since we we've lost well, Pedro. Uh, we've other so right? one thing you say, hey Matt, do you think it's reasonable that a crayfish gives birth? You know, a virgin crayfish can give birth. And you would say not up until 2018, but now there's a there species in Germany that just clones itself every generation. Uh, it's called the marbled crayfish. And it's just, it's all females, and it's every every member of that species is a clone of the other. Um, yeah, there are so a number of lizards that do that, yeah. that I want. I've been, I've been act. there was someone who was selling um, a, a collection of parthenogenic lizards, and I reached out to her, and I was like, you know, I, wa I was going to buy like four or five of them, just set up a colony and have them around all the time and be able to talk about them every time something like this comes up. Um, so, you know, if you were, if we're going to X-Men land or whatever, like it, it's not necessarily inconceivable that Mary was a, had a mutation, this same mutation that we've seen in other animals. Uh, and that didn't get carried on because Jesus didn't have kids, you know, but you know, it's, again, it's not implausible. So that's a, it's a weird angle to take, but also like, why does he want to call people stupid? Like, I guess if you just want to have permission from us to call people stupid i go guess go ahead and fill your boots and whatever arbitrary criteria you want to use to call people stupid go ahead yeah uh, we're in the business okay. of changing people's minds though i guess right so yeah and i've i've screwed up many times and and here's the thing um to me what really count i've already talked about what really counts is, is stupid um i i have friends who engage in these sorts of discussions quite a lot and some of them are like so and so such and such apologist is lying and i know they're lying because i've already explained this to them and they're just denying <laughs> yeah. it but there's a difference between that person isn't convinced and that person is lying i i i, I i'm much freer with pointing out when people are being dishonest in conversation now including calling them out for a lie that they've been caught in not as an assessment of somebody's entire character but because you know i like i think there's stuff that needs to be called out um i i could sit here and have i could sit here till at least midnight taking calls and having conversations and as long as we're, we're all actually saying here's what i think and why I, I got no problem with it it doesn't matter how stupid i think i i prefer to look at it like an idea is stupid only when it's you know as i was saying like harmful or it would absolutely be stupid of me to cut myself with the pressure washer again in the exact same way that i'd done it and it could happen but it, that it also could be that maybe i um i, I do it accidentally or i develop sort some sort of mental aberration that um just makes me careless or it results in the same thing and uh that wouldn't make it stupid you know people with alzheimer's aren't stupid right yeah you're advocating in a way that the einsteinian uh definition of insanity is probably closer to stupidity the idea that we you know if you repeat if you keep repeat making the same mistakes and thinking expecting different results that might be stupid but again um people who are completely convinced like his arguments against the virgin birth there and it's funny we had to put our jesus hats on there for a minute but good grief it's not yeah. incoherent in the worldview well uh, somebody in chat and we'll get to another caller in a minute somebody in chat uh let me go back and actually try and read this so that we can address it and it was uh aren't miracles impossible by definition because if they were possible they wouldn't be miracles so really is there any point in talking about the rationality of miracles when miracles defy reason uh my take is the miracles aren't impossible because they violate the, the laws of nature um they're just an example now, granted, I haven't seen a miracle. I don't know that a miracle has ever occurred. But if you say miracles can't happen because they violate nature or reason or rationality, then you're saying that 
nothing could ever violate nature. So you're, you're default declaring there's nothing supernatural. There are no gods. There are no, nothing can violate this. And I don't know how you demonstrate that. Uh, because I have no way to properly investigate to determine whether or not a miracle is possible or not. What needs to happen is somebody who claims that a miracle has occurred needs to actually present evidence uh, and data so that we can evaluate it and say, you know what? We have this understanding about how reality works. And just to make it easy, our understanding is that uh, a little piece, a round piece of bread does not turn into human flesh. We have no confirmed examples of this happening, no mechanism that could show how it could happen. There's no known natural mechanism by which a cracker can turn into human tissue or God human tissue, who knows. That doesn't in any way demonstrate that it cannot happen by means that we aren't aware of. You don't get to rule out everything that you don't know and don't have an example of and just say, oh, that's impossible. Possibility needs to be demonstrated as does impossibility. And so if you want to say it's not possible for this cracker under any circumstances to turn into human tissue, now you're, you, you've, you've got some work ahead of you. In the meantime, the burden of proof is on the people who are claiming that that cracker does transubstantiate into specifically the you know human genetic material of jesus of nazareth i don't know how they could ever demonstrate that because even if it turned into human tissue how would you know it was jesus's human tissue do we have a dna <laughs> sample from back then and my my favorite uh, joke about all that is which part of jesus does it turn into is it like a toenail or a foreskin <laughs> or you know <laughs> Which, which part of those palpable? Mm, yeah, yikes. I uh, I ended the poll because it had been thirty minutes, and I need that function so I can promote super chats and and call-ins and stuff. But uh, you have seventy-seven percent say yes, it's fucking stupid to pay someone to not tell someone to shut up, and twenty-two percent say no. And that's with six hundred and twelve votes, with nine hundred and eighty-nine people watching. Um, so there's our poll. Uh, we'll we'll see if anything comes of it. If it if it winds up being good. If this person wants to have a conversation. If um, I, I think what happened is, and I wasn't. I can't always pay attention to chat. I'm pretty good at multitasking, but I can't always watch it. So I didn't see what was actually going on in chat. Now that the poll is actually over, maybe later in the show we'll we'll talk about this a little bit. But it's a call in show, and we've got callers, and I want to take callers. I know Paul does. I love. I do. Dylan in Georgia, pronouns are he, him, uh, wants to talk about religion and whether it could be a good thing. So welcome, Dylan. How are you? Uh-oh, I don't hear Dylan. Oh, sorry, I was muted. <laughs> there, there we go. I'm glad it wasn't on our to me before. We're all good. No. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm going to mute in a second um, just, just to be sure. Okay. Go ahead. So we're live. What do you want to talk about? Question. <laughs> All right. Um, basically, um, I was talking to some of my family members about it. I'm not a believer. I'm an atheist. But I was wondering, could some form of religion possibly be good for people if if that's what they truly think makes them a good person? Sure. Okay. <laughs> All right. I was just trying like, to explain it. Uh, some of my family members thought maybe not. Just didn't. I'm, I couldn't clarify my take on it because I'm not really good at that. So I thought I might ask you guys to hear your take. Yeah, I'm happy to go into more detail. I just figured I'd give a quick answer and then Paul can chime in and I can address it or not. All right. Well, there's a famous clip from Ray Comfort interviewing Eric Hovind. Uh, both of whom are apologists you may not have heard of that I deal with on my channel quite a bit. And um, they're discussing with each other that if they weren't believers, they both insist that they would be in prison for various things that they would do. They're convinced that if God wasn't in their lives, that they would be breaking the law. Like they'd be so immoral that they would you know, need to be put away to protect society. And in that case, you know, those are individuals for whom, okay, 
I kind of hope they remain Christians because I don't want to unleash that kind of level of chaos into into the world. Uh, I suspect that they are incorrect, though. I suspect that if they were to become convinced that Jesus wasn't, uh, didn't actually die for their sins and re was resurrected, that they probably would remain roughly the same moral characters that they are today within within some standard deviation, I suppose, if that's a measurable thing. But that doesn't, just because there are individuals now who have been raised that way and are raised to think that way, that doesn't mean the long-term best case for everyone is that we continue to keep that way of indoctrination in order to, for behavior control purposes, right? Because yeah. if, if we could get to the point where uh, someone like a Ray Comfort and an Eric Hovind weren't actually raised to think that's why they were being good, it would no longer be the controlling factor and they would be good because of empathy and they'd be good because uh, of other things. So yes, I, I agree that there's individual cases where, but, but I feel like those are unfortunate cases. It's unfortunate that that person I attributes, agree. um, you know, the, their, their empathy and the, and the good things that they do in life that we would label as good because it promotes flourishing to a God that they've outsourced it. Uh, that's just, uh, an attribution error as far as I'm concerned. So I agree there are individuals in our current life, but I aspire to a world where uh, we don't need that. So I'm not looking to hold on to it uh, as a behavior control uh, mechanism. I guess that's, that's my thought. Yeah. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm in very much the same boat. No, no surprise. Um, the thing is, <laughs> if the question is, can religion benefit people? I'd say that, Yes, religions can in fact benefit people, and they do constantly, which is why people stay religious. Yeah, because if you have a comforting lie, it's still comforting, even if it's not true. Um, and so religions provide people with quite often, and it depends on the religion, so there's gonna be a bunch of different, uh, not all of them are gonna be the same, but religions often provide people with community, with uh, a sense of value and worth, with some easy answers to some potentially difficult questions, maybe about morality, may not be the right answers, um, but morality, origins, death, things like that. Um, if you are if you are suffering anxiety from not knowing the answers to something, pretending that you know can alleviate that anxiety. And, and, and if religions have convinced you that you know the answers to things that other people are struggling with uh, and you don't put any more effort into it, all of that is beneficial. And in many cases, the sincere belief in that religion, as Paul was addressing, may help people act in a better way, or at least gives them a, a reason, a justification for why they act a certain way, even if they might otherwise want to do something else. So yes, I think religions can and do benefit people regularly. My biggest kind of take on this is that I'm not aware of any benefit from any religion that is real and true that is contingent on that religion. And, and, and in the sense of, I don't know that you can't get the same benefit from some other religion, from some comforting lie, or from some actual truth. Now, it may be that, you know, like, for example, Dave Warnock will be hosting Dying Out Loud tomorrow. Dave uh, has a a terminal disease, ALS. Um, if he were religious, there might be a certain type of hope that he could get about an afterlife that would make his life better right in, in the short term. But I watched Dave, and I've watched other people dealing with terminal illnesses before who were religious. And I think that Dave gets the a, a similar, if not better, comfort and support from being open and honest about it and engaging with a community and getting support from the community. Um, and that's someone um, that you may, may consider tuning into the show tomorrow and asking Dave this question to get his thoughts as well. All right. I mean, yeah, I mean, that's a good explanation. I just didn't know how to word it properly, but that was awesome. Well, well thanks Dylan. Anything else? 
yeah. No, nah, that was basically it. Sweet. Well, we appreciate you calling in to Because I Want on the line, and I'm going to move on to some other callers. So if you get any other questions, feel free to give us a jingle. Huh. It's, it's, it's so wild because normally I'm doing, I, I hope, we, I hope we get some theistic callers, but cause I want to is one of those things where it's just, you know, we we're doing it cause I want to, I'm trying not to put any, you know, strict limits or requirements on it. I'd love to get some theistic call in, but I'm also, I tend to avoid the, the advice calls from atheists when we're doing like the Sunday show and stuff like that. Right. Exactly. It, it's, and so I would expect that's prime to be more time, right? That's the yeah, yeah. That's when that's when the theists are all tuned in, and we want to put our best uh, attack. Well, not attack our best defense face forward, I guess. But this is this is for friends and family. We're 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 hanging out. And here here we go right here because John uh, pronouns are he him from New York is an atheist calling in to talk about uh, our intentions. So John, you are on because I want to on the line. Welcome. Hey guys, uh, first of all, I just want to say that I watched a lot of your your videos and uh, I think you guys are both great. Um, my question was simply, um, is the point of these conversations to convince others that their evidence is insufficient for them to believe or insufficient for you to believe? Hmm. Neither. Um, All right. I, I engage in debates and discussions because I want to get to the truth. If in fact I'm wrong and they have good reason and evidence, then I'd like to know that. And if the caller is wrong, I'd like to either perhaps help them try to realize that. But we also know that once someone has made a public profession and defended it publicly, they're less likely to change their mind. And in the 19 years that I've been doing these call-in shows, it's it's very rare that somebody changes their mind live during a call. What I'm trying to do is have the sort of discussion so that the people who are sitting out there who agree with the caller, who agree with the caller for the same reasons the caller is um, is is arguing on behalf of, they get the benefit of having their views challenged without the drawback of being in in the spotlight uh and so that gives them the ability to think i'm i'm i if i'm wrong i'm wrong i would love to know it but i don't go into it going hey let me point out to every caller why they're wrong or why we don't believe them or why it's not good enough reason that tends to happen but it's not it's not the goal if i'm wrong i want to know there's also option Oh, go ahead, Paul. Thanks. Sorry. All I was going to say is, you know, so the so Matt gave option C, and that is, you know, it, the conversation is for the sake of someone who's listening who might say have the opinion of the caller. Um, earlier in the show, we actually had someone from column D, and that is for whom someone who has these kind of conversations but doesn't know how to articulate their own opinions particularly well because it's just not a conversation they have on a regular basis. So if they can tune in, to a show like this where we regularly have these conversations, uh, someone like Matt in particular and me slowly, we're getting a little bit better at articulating our points and and, and using some unique phraseology perhaps that, that can help. So, you know, let's call him D as well as someone who may, are, may agree with me, who is just looking for a way to, you know, to, to articulate those things. And then there's answer E for me a lot of the times I am attempting just to demonstrate that these conversations are even possible. Yeah. And I, because I'm trying to have these conversations always with the best chance to be amiable and to be polite and to find common ground and not let it explode into the kind of conversation you might have at a Thanksgiving heated Thanksgiving dinner or with someone you don't like, you know, so uh, there's, there's lots of different choices and there's probably a whole bunch that I didn't even list, but you know, those are, those are some of the reasons I do this. Yeah. So uh, everything that you guys said makes a ton of sense. Um, one of the things that, that inspired this question is something that 
I suspect both of you, but especially Matt, is familiar with, which is the what do you believe in why uh, framing? Mm. And so I, I, I guess that's what was inspiring this question, that when you ask someone why do they believe X and Y, is it to demonstrate that their their process for reaching any given conclusion is flawed, or is it to demonstrate that they can't convince you? So, for example, and I know, Paul, you've, you've talked about, um, and Matt, you've talked about this too, but um, you've talked about personal testimony a lot. And personal testimony is impossibly convincing to a third party, but it doesn't in and of itself disprove the veracity of that thing. So I, I'm I'm just kind of trying to wonder how you guys interact with with that uh, that conflict, I guess. Yeah. So a minute ago, you you, you kind of asked even even though I think we kind of addressed this, if we're doing this to show that the caller can't convince us or, or if I'm doing it because I want to show that the caller can't convince me. And in, to some extent, that's the exact opposite of what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to show that they can convince me that I can be convinced of anything okay. if there's sufficient evidence, if it's presented, if, if you have a valid structured argument with sound premises, you can convince me of anything. And if I remain unconvinced, what I'm trying to do trying to do is show them why I'm unconvinced. What is wrong with their argument? Is it invalid in structure? Is it uh, not uh, is it not sound? Is there no good reason to believe this? So I, I'm I'm showing people how hopefully I'm showing people how to do a lot of things, including screw up on occasion, but I'm I'm showing people how to think critically about here's pick any two people where one person is convinced of something and the, and the other person is not convinced of it. Um, it may be that we don't know what the truth of that situation is, but we can still evaluate why the one person is convinced and determine whether or not they should be. And if the person who is unconvinced, um, is being, you know, obstinate, if they've confused skepticism for cynicism, where oh I'm you're nothing you can say will ever convince me. Yeah, to to me my goal is not to show them that they can't convince me. It's to show them that they absolutely could if they had sufficient evidence in a in an argument. Yeah, that's a cool one. Right. So uh, I'm sitting here by myself, nodding to myself at what both of you guys are saying. Um, but, uh, so all of that makes a, a ton of sense to me and, and I don't want to waste too much more of your time, but I guess to, to wrap it up, I had one final, uh, question for you guys, which is one of the, the, uh, comments that, I often hear in these kinds of debates, particularly within the context of presupposition, is that reasons for any given condition are sufficiently justified by God. Now, I, I have a, an answer that I don't find completely compelling to myself, but um, but I'm curious what you guys would have to to the challenge that whatever situation that you find to be objectionable isn't um, sufficiently justified to someone that has more um, more access to information than you do. I I. I... I'm not sure that I followed the question. I, I thought, yeah, it, can you can you rephrase the question just a little? Because I I sure. somehow got lost somewhere. Sure, sure. Yeah, no worries. Um, 
so frequently when we object to conditions of existence, like, for example, the problem of evil, a presuppositionalist will say that the reason that this exists is because God is sufficiently justified. There are reasons that we don't understand, also known as the mystery of God, right? How do you respond to that that response, that the unknowability of God um, and that his reasons would be sufficient even if we don't understand them ah, are okay. in and of themselves a, a response to the question. Okay, so I'm going to let Paul answer this at least to start with, but I also want to point out that you said a presuppositionalist. Uh, l let me chime in with my pet peeve. Um, there's nothing about this that is tied necessarily to presuppositionalist apologetics. The problem of evil is something Absolutely. that, uh, so there's no point. I, I'm, I'm bringing it up because I can't count how many times I've seen atheists use presuppositionalist as if it's a s slur or a catch-all <laughs> for whatever gobbledygook they're, they feel they're having to deal with. And so yeah. there's, a, there's a legitimate problem of evil question and it does you know, whether you're a presuppositionalist or not there has to be some sort of explanation for it and so you're asking how do you respond to and we'll let paul respond to god knows more than us and god has a better yeah. understanding of all this than us and so who are you to determine uh that god doesn't have sufficient reason to allow for you know cancer i might be the entirely right. wrong atheist to ask about this i've de i've debated bart Ehrman on this offline uh, personally, he thinks the problem of evil is a big deal. I do not think the problem of evil is a big deal. Um, I think that the answer of God, if there is, if there's a God, the way the Christian uh, story worldview describes, it is to me, it's entirely conceivable, just like it was entirely conceivable, you know, earlier that he could do a virgin birth. That that if that description of that God is accurate, that that one he may well have. Uh, a moral reason that I don't understand, you know, like a seven D chess, as it were, like you know that that he's allowing me to have cancer so that six generations down the road something will happen that is a desirable outcome. Like I, I'm on board. So so this, unfortunately, you probably asked the wrong person. <laughs> if that if you were looking for me to say the opposite, I, if I want to answer your question from before when you were saying. Like a better example might have been the personal testimony that you gave earlier where someone's going to call in and they say, well, I have this personal testimony that I had cancer and it was cured and, but there's no document like, and, or that I had this personal experience and God said it was really real to me. You know, that wouldn't be convincing to me. So that would be maybe be a better example where you're driving to, but I understand that that is still at the same time, the thing that is most likely to turn me back to Christianity because I've seen, I think, what are the best arguments? And I've seen what the best, you know, uh, evidence that's available and that's not convincing, but perhaps if God did directly speak to me and I could verify in some sense that I wasn't hallucinating, if he gave me external information and things like that, for me, that would maybe you know, be the thing that would get me there. But I would then still understand that my personal testimony in that experience is no good for anyone else. It doesn't help my neighbor. It doesn't help my friends. Uh, you know, God needs to, in that case, if that's his plan, would need to go around and individually do these kind of things. So uh, someone calling in with their personal testimony, I like to discuss with them and to explain to them why that's not good information for a third party. Uh, so I think those are helpful conversations. But uh, again, that I think, you know, driving to your question, I, I deal with it in trying to demonstrate why it's, it's not helpful. Uh, and the whole problem of evil thing, you lost me. So I'll hand back to Matt. Yeah, and so this, I, I've thought of something, John, that I know I've said before, and uh, I'm just, let me just say that I pretty much completely agree with Paul again, in that I don't find the problem of evil particularly compelling. I know many people do. I know it's the reason why many people have left their religion. Um, 
I, I don't find it all that compelling. But I will say this. If you're looking for ways to address when this comes up, I, here's the questions yeah. that I want to know from the apologist. Number one, why can't God explain his reasoning to me in a way that I can understand? Now, maybe God is playing 70 chess, but I want to know why can't God explain it to me in a way that I can understand? And the second part of that is why doesn't he even try to explain? And you, the, the apologist can come back and say, well, he knows you know, what the result of that explanation is going to be, so there's no point in him trying. And I'm like, okay, how is that scenario any different from my point of view of that God not existing, a God that's not going to interact with me to even attempt to explain it? But then there's a follow-up question, which is, why couldn't God create us in a way that we could understand? Um, the, the, the notion that there's some barrier to communication, is God just an an ineffective communicator, but no matter how they answer those, it then gets to the what I, th I think is the final nail in the coffin for, for this line of discussion, which is how can a God possibly fault me for failing to understand something that he knows I can't understand, did not create me capable of understanding, never made an attempt to explain it in a way I could understand, how can I be faulted for failing to achieve something that the individual who created me made sure I couldn't conceive? It's the death knell for this, oh, God works in mysterious ways. Yeah, and those mysterious ways are identical to him not existing. So, so Matt, I, I really... I sincerely did not intend for this call to go on as long as it did, but the thing that you just said, so I, I understand what you're saying. All of these things don't necessarily are, are, are unconvincing in and of themselves right now, but the 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 context in which you frame this is why wouldn't god convince me right this moment that this is the case but how would you respond to the challenge that this is incremental this is progressive that this is part of you aren't you aren't going to come to jesus Allah Buddha, whatever, until a second before you die. Okay. okay. I, don't, I, don't, I don't see how that's a response to any of it. Um, it. It seems to me more like another excuse, like the people who say, I'll find out after I die. Okay. There's nothing I can do about it. I'm doing everything that I can do. And if there is some God who's willing to judge me for failing to do something that I am literally incapable of when he specifically created me and seemingly created me knowing that this was going to be the situation, if God created the universe and God could have created the universe differently, but that means that God specifically chose to pick the universe in which I can't understand his reasoning and in a universe in which he does not attempt to explain that and a universe in which he judges me for that. I am completely um, a, a, a leaf on the wind uh, of a God. I have no decision. I have no free will. I have no capacity to act as even an agent. Everything about me was predetermined by the God who created this universe instead of the one where I remained a Christian or created this universe instead of the one where I'm willing to say, you know what, I don't need to understand it. I'll just trust that a God I've never interacted with who may not exist understands it. Um, there, the thing is, this is so irrational that if there is a God, that God is stupid as fuck. And we just had that whole conversation about don't call people stupid. But if you're supposedly the creator of the universe and just incredibly intelligent and you create a bunch of people and then punish them for failing to be better than you created them and punish them 
for not making a decision that they literally cannot make um, and punish them for using their brain to assess something when that is exactly how we have to evaluate everything else in the world, then you are an immoral monster. Uh, not you, but the God in question, unless you are that God, in which case, why the hell are you asking us questions instead of explaining it to us? All right, guys, uh, you guys are both wonderful. Uh, please keep doing what you do. Um, it's, it's been a pleasure to talk to you guys. Thanks, John. Thanks. Have a happy Monday. So we've been going at it for about an hour now. We've got one more caller uh, on the line, but there are lines open. So if you are, uh, well, if you're one of the theists who is trying to talk trash and chat or um, advocate for uh, a god in chat, you do realize that the the mods are just not going to allow that. We're not going to allow that. All you have to do is pick up a phone and dial in. Show that you are, especially if you're a Christian, show that you're unashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that it's a power unto salvation, that you are willing to do and fulfill your obligation under 1 Peter 3.15 to call in and tell us the reason for the faith that you have. I, I don't understand why. Well, I took Christianity seriously when I was a believer. I'm an atheist because I sought to be a better defender of Christianity. And in the process of trying to find a way to better defend Christianity, I found out that, as far as I can tell, that's just not possible. Um, I, I, I have seen no better defense than the defense that I offered. And when you start to compare um, the various apologists, and I know Paul and I have have done some things together where we poke fun back at the ones who are, are trying to do stuff. Um, the, wow, thanks, John. Um, that's that's wow. incredibly impressive, which reminds me, by the way, uh, I believe, and I'll have the producer chime in here, I believe we're going to be reading Super Chats over five bucks. Is that right? Yep, five dollars is the threshold for tonight. Sure. So rather than doing, you know, the $10 threshold for Hang Up or whatever else, but anything over five dollars, Super Chat, uh, we're going to read them after we're done with calls, but the and and that was that was so generous that it distracted me from what I was thinking. So Paul, finish my thought for me because you were paying attention. Well, I, no, I, I equally undistracted. So we yeah we were, we were talking about we would need to you know we we were vigorous defenders of the faith and we we lost yes. it because uh, because because we were looking for to to defend it as true, not to tear it down. So I it's oh, a comparing apologist Mark where you're. Yeah, comparing apologists, it, it was um, a lot of people will make fun of Ray Comfort. Um, I've debated Ray a couple times. I've you know interacted with him a, a bunch of different times. Um, Ray is on the weaker end of Christian apologists with regard to rigor depth philosophical depth i would say mm. but he is consistent and somewhat uh, honest and straightforward etc but the arguments that ray presents are not fundamentally different from the ones that for example william lane craig would present where even amongst christians those two are viewed on very different tiers with regard to the quality of their apologetics which is strange to me also. I never I never really considered this until the words started coming out of my mouth. The notion that there would be tears of apologists when all of them are supposed to be a vessel for the Holy Spirit to interact with the world and convict human beings in order to uh, uh, allow God to uh, do what God's doing. Why on earth would there ever be a bad apologist? Why? I mean, and granted, we can't tell who is or isn't a, a, a true Christian, but it's it's very strange to me that there would be apologists that even Christians would say, "Oh, they're bad at this." Why would God well, Frank ever? Frank Turk would if, say would say that there's you know there's people who play Mozart better than other people who play Mozart, right? That's not Mozart's fault. True, like but the, it's, not, it's not it's not God, it's not God, it's not God's fault that there are some apologists who are better at what they do than others. I guess. You could debate why there isn't even a need for apologetics if God is what he says to be. But. Well, you would think that if 
if I was an apologist and wasn't particularly good at it, I would pray and ask God to make me better at it. Mm. And and then God would either make me better at it or God would come and say, yeah, it, engaging in apologetics isn't your, your thing. That's not why you're here. You're here to support the other apologists. You're here to to be the audience member who claps when they say something wonderful. You're you're here to be the person who tells your neighbor, "Hey, come with me to listen to what Bill Craig has to say." Uh, that's what. But but God doesn't appear to do that. Instead, He just seemingly lets people run around with these uh, delusions that they are really doing a good job. Because I'll go in and do a debate on modern day debates or or, or wherever else. And I'll watch chat a little bit. And man, the Christians are always convinced that I am a massive idiot who's been shown up at every opportunity and that I'm just spewing word salad, no matter who I'm up against. And it's, I, I, can, I can be confident that that is absolutely not the case, uh, even if it has been the case on some occasion, you know, that, that I was just speaking gibberish. Right. Well, first Peter actually, unfortunately, you know, doesn't speak specific. First Peter three speaks to everyone. It, it lays, even though I don't think that book is written by Peter or anyone like him. Um, it, it, it actually commands all the Christians to always be prepared to give a defense. So they, they all take it upon themselves to, to do that. Whereas, you know, gifts like tongues and prophecy and, uh, you know, all the other spiritual gifts that they, they hospitality, all those things. Those are, those are for some people to do. They think apologetics is the one that everyone needs to do. And I guess it makes sense because everyone has their own reasons for believing. Yeah. So somebody, somebody in chat said that Ray comfort thinks that the eye is perfect. And I already replied to chat because I don't think Ray would think that I, I, I would ask him, I haven't spoken to him. Uh, oh, beta Ray says he outright said it was in one of his videos. Um, then Ray is saying things that are unbiblical because nothing in the Bible suggests that anything about human beings as a creation is perfect. As a matter of fact, if you read through Genesis, it's like, you know, and it was good. God did this and it was good and it was good. It's, we're, we're fallen. Nobody, it's bizarre to, to find an apologist who thinks that the eye is perfect, but. And he may have misspoken just as, you know, I uh, prefer scripted videos to live videos because I'm prone to sometimes misspeak, misspeak something, just, just as I did there. Because um, I am also covering Ray Comfort's evolution seminar on my on my main channel, and he definitely does acknowledge what Matt just said, and that is that the body is fallen and that the eye that we have now is not what God intended, which sends Shannon into uh, tizzy because, like, did... Did Eve eating the apple literally change the physiology of our eyes in some way? Yeah. You know, like to, to create a blind spot that wasn't there before or something like that. But um, um, so I think Ray is at best inconsistent on this point. Well, maybe somebody can message Ray. He can call in and we can have a conversation about the sure. eye before the show's over. Because we'll take, I'll, I would take a call from Ray. Um, Absolutely. You know, I, I don't plan to ever do another uh, debate with him like that but you know on a call-in show ray if you're out there call in and explain to us whether or not the eye is perfect and what you meant or mm -hmm. did you misspeak um and you know ray by the way can also apply for end boss as well but uh we got a couple other callers here to get to we have uh grumpy friends he him uh, has uh has something for you paul so welcome grumpy you oh, are great. live on the because i want to show hi there I love both of you guys. Thank you so Thank much. You, and, uh, so Matt, I've been an atheist for a very long time, but Matt, you taught me to be a skeptic. And Paul, you sparked my interest in New Testament studies. Awesome. My question was about, uh, if, if I'm characterizing uh, Paul correctly, is that uh, he says that uh, Visions by Paul and Peter were sufficient to start Christianity. I understand the basis for believing that Paul had visions. Do we mm -hmm. specifically have any evidence that Peter had visions, or are we just granting that? So this is an excellent question. Uh, to give a slight bit of background to the audience, so I have a resurrection hypothesis, a naturalistic hypothesis that 
contends that really only two people need, as you said, only two people needed to have visions of Jesus in order to explain Christianity as we have it now. Paul is the only firsthand account we have, and so we are accepting, I accept what the scholars accept, and that is that seven of the letters attributed to Paul are authentic and genuine and were written by someone who, who, who meant what they were saying. And in those letters, Paul says that he has a vision. He doesn't go into more detail than that, but we're accepting that on, as we would a normal historical document, he's self-reporting a vision. That's not an unusual claim, so so great. So we're accepting that Paul had a vision uh, based on that. Now, you're asking why I'm assuming Peter. Um, I think Peter is a very good candidate for the person that had a vision prior to that. But it need not have actually been Peter. But we do know very strong historical basis that Christianity existed before Paul converted, right? Paul himself says he was persecuting Christians. So if we're accepting any of this at all, we would need to take his self-report that he was persecuting Christians and somehow Christianity had to exist, therefore. We also, it's pretty clear that the tenet of Christianity that is built upon was that Jesus resurrected from the dead. There doesn't seem to be anywhere in history where there is a Christianity outside of the resurrection claim. So, someone before Paul thinks that they saw Jesus risen, in whatever form that may well be, bodily, not bodily, however you interpret it. Um, I think a super strong candidate for that is Peter, in that Peter met Paul. They, they, Paul reports this, that they met each other and that they had some level of coming to uh, coming to minds on what happened, even though they d disagreed on many things. So, um, it, it would be weird if Paul said that Peter s had this vision and had met him, but didn't, but Peter didn't also say that he did. It's possible he didn't, but I just think he's a really good candidate. Um, so does that make any sense to you? Someone had to start Christianity before Paul could convert to it. Um, and so he's my candidate of choice, even though other people's... Uh, Bart Ehrman thinks that it probably was Mary Magdalene, for example. Uh, he doesn't agree with me on this. So does that make any sense? Well, that makes a lot of sense. I hadn't heard uh, Bart's take on Mary Magdalene on this, but find very interesting. actually i think i'm no sorry i'm i'm uh, dale allison dale allison is who i met the uh, who is a christian dale allison thinks that my hypothesis works other than that if it was mary but uh sorry didn't mean to i just didn't want to misrepresent bart here all right i've Carry on. seen that show but, yeah but uh I, I i find this all possible i just wanted to make sure that i understood your position you said that these two were sufficient to start christianity mm -hmm. that i wasn't missing some information we had on Peter actually having the vision versus what Acts asserts he had us as a vision, which I do not uh, right. take as granted. So what we don't have is a single word from Peter firsthand. There's just not a single word that we know he wrote. Um, we also, this this notion that he was tied to Mark, the, the author of the book we call Mark, is entirely sketchy and dubious and uh, the people involved don't report this themselves. It was something that was attributed to them by 180 uh, AD, not in the first century at all. So, you know, again, I'm just going off of that Peter is a good candidate. And and we do have pretty good reason to think that he was killed by Nero as a leader of the Christians. So, again, just a good candidate. But some, I think you would agree that someone had to start Christianity before Paul got there. So... That's that's my thinking. Well, that, oh, that that sounds entirely plausible. I would agree that yep. Christianity existed before Paul came around, and uh, I think Peter's as good as can't say anybody. I just wanted to know if we had specific evidence. Or we're we just don't. Out Peter. We 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 don't. We just have we have re really good evidence that Peter was a dude that existed, uh, that and that he was a leader of the church, and that he met Paul. So those are those are the those are the kind of circumstantial things we're basing it on. Um, what is the more interesting question I find now is um, what did Christianity look like before Paul got a hold of it? Because it's clear that whatever Paul did um, transformed a lot of people's thinking. And so would we even recognize the Christianity that exists before he got there? Not sure, but at least it, ex it existed.
And that's a that's an exercise for the viewer, I guess. I would love to know that uh, information someday. Yeah, we we all would. Uh, unfortunately, Paul is the first writing, and so everything that comes afterwards was tainted by, or you know, already already colored by his whatever sunglasses he was wearing to to flavor it. So, but anyway, I, I hope that helped uh, explain my position, and and feel free to push back if if you think that I'm wrong on any of that. Well, this all sounds good from here. You answered my question. That's pretty okay. much all I have. All right. Well, you you didn't sound very grumpy, so you didn't earn your nickname. <laughs> well, it's, it's it's a long story, but I'm actually usually pretty cheerful. I go. All right. Well, it's very, probably it's story. ironic. Probably that's right. It's like Col good. it's like Colin Penn giving Penn Gillette the nickname Tiny. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Thanks for the call. So, all right. Thank you. Thanks, Grumpy. Sorry if that was inside baseball for everyone else. No, I actually got distracted because uh, the individual who who posted the the challenge um, to to for me to not tell anyone to just shut up for a hundred bucks, and then uh, the the first message. I want to I want to make this kind of clear because we may have to post another poll at some point. <laughs> um. The message, I'm going to read this word for word. Can you consider the possibility that it isn't stupid? Because I had, had said that this $100 challenge was stupid. And it says literally, for an additional $400, you can mention this challenge at the beginning of the show and ask viewers to chime in as to whether the challenge is fucking stupid. If you fail the test, you still get to keep the $400. That's the poll that we put up was literally asking the viewers to chime in on whether or not that challenge paying someone to not call someone stupid or to paying someone to, to not tell people to shut up was fucking stupid. We, I, I literally went with what this individual said. And now in, uh, in the message, I'm be, it's, it's been said, you made no attempt to present the question fairly. We should have agreed to the precise language before proceeding. I could care less whether people think I'm stupid. The, the, the poll didn't ask whether or not you were stupid. Uh, the entire question was to ask the audience whether it's appropriate or helpful for you, for me, to consistently tell people to shut up as something that is helpful for, or beneficial to the atheist community and its mission. Um, no, that wasn't the challenge. That's not what you suggested uh, I needed to put up there. Um, my, my poll didn't ask people to chime in on whether or not you were stupid. It was whether or not your challenge was stupid, whether or not it's fucking stupid to challenge someone to not tell people to shut up. At no point in this discussion did you mention anything about whether or not it's helpful uh, for me to consistently tell people to shut up. First of all, I don't, I don't know that consistently is a fair representation of what actually happens. Um, at no point was it discussed that... Um, and then you continue with as something that is helpful or beneficial to the atheist community and its mission. There was no discussion. You didn't talk to me. I didn't say that it was helpful or beneficial to the atheist community or its mission, and we didn't have a discussion about whether or not it's harmful. And right now, John, you sound like somebody who stuck their money, stuck their neck out for 400 bucks and are trying to find a way out of it. So if you'd like me to put up another poll, pay for the first one. By the way, that's probably a good thing we can do. In addition to being able to read $5 Super Chats a little later on, if you have an interest in having our audience answer a poll, I'm, I can't say this for sure because I haven't discussed it with Jimmy yet, it may be possible for you to donate a certain amount in order to mm. get us to put up a poll uh, to get our audience's feedback on the issue that you're concerned about. Um, I, I'm wondering. I'm gonna... Go ahead. I, and this is, this is my last little wondering here. I'm legitimately wondering if this person is now saying this kind of sideways take on this in order to see if they can get me to tell them to shut up <laughs> during the show, except that if that was the case, then perhaps they should have called in. Uh, mm. Perhaps you should have called in and had a discussion about whether or not it's helpful or beneficial to the atheist community and its mission, or whether or not it's helpful for me to consistently tell people to shut up. Um, but he, he does say, in all fairness, at the end of that, um, at the end of it, he says, my bad. 
which seems to be acknowledging that he phrased this poorly on a couple of different occasions uh, and, and did not manage to get what he, he wanted out of it. So maybe we'll put up another poll. Maybe we won't. I'll wait back to hear um, on whether or not we're going to reconcile this. Uh, thing I, here. But I've you, been you an atheist you were for a while say. now. I, 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 I'm more curious as to, um, I'm not sure that I understand or know about this atheist mission of which he speaks and whether I am actually actively working towards it or not. I didn't know that we had a mission. Do yeah. we as atheists have a mission? I Is it because of the, I, I don't know nothing we have about mission. atheism that requires, yeah, we're not recruiting yeah. necessarily. I, I'm, a, I'm a skeptic and a humanist first, and I think I would probably say that I have a mission as a skeptic personally, and I have a mission as a humanist personally, not that I'm required to have any sort of mission for either of those. As an atheist, um, I think I think any mission that I have as an atheist, it, it also being uh, self-determined, um, it, it either falls under the skepticism, or it has to fall under the skepticism of humanism. Because what I'm trying, what I'm advocating for on behalf of my atheism is moving us closer to something like atheist normalcy or an end to religious privilege and, and making non-believers second-class citizens. Um, but that's not everybody's mission. I'm a, I know atheists who do not support or favor church-state separation. I know atheists who think that religion and Christianity are good things that they should support and promote. And, and they have, well, I think they have really bad arguments. Um, they at least have some. Okay, so I'm good thing. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't know we had any mission statement. So apparently we don't. So this is good, good to know that I'm not, not missing out. But no, we all have our own ways of doing our not believing in God. Uh, and I don't think there is a wrong way. If you want to keep, if you want to leave everyone else alone about their beliefs until it infringes upon you, that is your right. And I do not uh, object. All right, so we got a couple more calls here. Ryan in California is an atheist pronouns are he, him. Ryan, you're on the Cuz I Want to show with two people who want to be here and answer your questions. So what do you got for us? Cool, thanks. Great show. Hey, um, look, I, I'm, we're always told to like apportion our belief to the evidence and whatnot. And, um, and I'm, I'm like, I'm a third generation atheist. But anyway, um, you know, Jesus, not, no one was alive to write about him, or no one wrote about Jesus during his time alive until 30 years after he was dead. No one, no one, there's no mention of him, as far as I know, in any other, like, you know, publication or anything, anywhere, tax records. So why aren't you guys myth mythicists? I just don't understand that. Like, it just seems like you would say, like, the default position would be to be a mythicist until someone proves you that he actually did exist at the exact time instead of after the fact. So are there other people who existed who nobody wrote about? Uh, yeah. So why don't you think they're a myth? Yeah, I guess maybe, um, yeah, I guess you're right. Like maybe they're not myths, but I guess because of the, all the extra stuff that Jesus gets, like he gets all this extra, you know, cred Ugh. basically for saying, I, 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 don't I don't believe I don't believe that Jesus performed any miracles. I'm not even convinced that he existed. I'm just also not convinced that he is in fact myth a, a myth. It would I think it's a mistake to assert that someone didn't exist because now you're adopting a burden of proof that you can't meet. And you don't get to say, mm. well, we don't we can't we 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 good should just default believe that everyone who's presented as a historical figure that we don't have sufficient evidence to conclude really did exist, we should just believe they didn't exist. You don't do that for anybody else, which was the, the purpose of, of my question. I don't believe That's any true. claims about Jesus are necessarily true. I don't think that the Bible uh, is an accurate reflection of his life if he existed or his words if he existed. I don't think the burden of proof has been met for any of those. But my, my mythicist friends, and by the way, uh, next week on Monday Skep Talk, John Gleason will be in here. I know John's a, a mythicist. Um, he, he will have ways to explain why he is a mythicist. I think it is a, 
a mismanagement and a misapplication of the burden of proof. If Jesus never existed, I'm happy to accept that once the burden of proof's met, but you don't get to do it by default, and you don't get to just say, well, there's these mythical-like stories about him. Here's the fun thing. List everything that is said about Jesus in the Bible, which is the only where, place we have a record of those things, and go through and line out everyone that uh, is extraordinary, that is supernatural, that would require some evidence, that you wouldn't believe for, for your mom, knowing your mom existed, line out every claim that if, if, you're, if somebody said your mom did this, you wouldn't believe it without additional evidence, and then look at what's left. And what you get with what's left is it's unclear uh, this person that we're talking about, whether it's a person, whether it's several people, uh, whether it's you know, which parts of the story uh, are real. Um, I don't think he was born of a virgin, but the notion that there was an itinerant Jewish rabbi who had followers and taught things and that those stories grew and, uh, and were expanded into legendary mythic status and that a whole bunch of untrue things were, were applied on them, I don't find that to be remotely remarkable. I, I, it, that's not extraordinary. That's that's what we have for lots of people. Um, I don't. There probably wasn't a, a King Arthur and Excalibur, but there may have been a person at the core of that. And I don't know who that person is, and I don't know who that Jesus person is either. So I'm not sitting here saying Jesus existed. The mythicists are nuts. I'm saying I don't believe any of the claims about Jesus, but I cannot assert that Jesus did not exist. It's like saying, if I'm if you're on trial for murder, I can say, I'm not convinced that you're guilty, but I'm also not convinced that you're innocent. As a matter of course, I'm going to rule not guilty, but that doesn't mean that I am convinced of your innocence. And I think, in, from my opinion, mythicists go one step too far. I Yeah, I, I think you're right. Those are all excellent points. I mean, Every every single thing we know about Jesus, like um, magic, like fucking the virgin birth, um, from the very beginning, everything. And so, like, I can't, I Not can't everything. pull myself out. Okay, like, I mean, the yeah, the okay, Sermon on the Mount. The, that are written, the Sermon yeah. on the Mount is the biggest block of stuff attributed to Jesus in the entirety of the New Testament. It's him giving a sermon. What is it about someone giving a sermon that is remotely extraordinary or unbelievable? I mean, I agree that that's a good point. I'm just saying my personal thing is it's hard yeah. for me to extract like all the miracle stuff out of it and just have it be random Joe preacher guy. Like, but I get it. You have, you make really good points. I totally get it. Well, let me ask you. So one of the things that we know about the Jesus stories that grew up around him is that two separate groups of people had to come up with very competing reasons why someone from Nazareth was actually born in Bethlehem so he could fulfill so he could fill messianic prophecy right so two entirely different traditions one recorded in Luke one recorded in Matthew and maybe there were others were explaining this away uh, again you know if this was why did this need to be explained away if this person didn't exist if there wasn't at least a tradition that the guy who the, you know, Jesus may have been based on came to be known to be from Nazareth. Now, it's not it's not impossible that that's a you know fictional thing, but that's one of those things we point to, and it's like, oh yeah, that that a guy walking around, people knew where he was from, and that didn't line up with the story. You know, again, that those are the kind of things that point to me to say, oh, maybe it makes sense that there was one or more people that this you know emerged from. So not right. as, as Matt was trying to say, not everything in there is an extraordinary claim. People came from Nazareth. Okay. You know, so we can, we can be a little bit more nuanced in, in our discussion. Uh, the other thing to yeah, do though, good. is if, if, if you want to have, if you want to just be a mythicist, that's great and fine. It is a barrier to having conversations with Christians. Um, I was a mythicist for a while, for a, for a, for a few minutes at one point, um, and I definitely experienced that that was 
that was a kind of a showstopper for having a, a, a discussion. So, so I, I am at least what I would call a methodological historicist, right? It's like, well, for the sake of my work here, let me grant at least that he existed so that we can have discussions. Yeah. Um, so there's some practical points to that as well, right? Even if I'm not fully convinced, uh, sometimes you're willing to grant things for the sake of argument. And so I feel like that this was based on an actual person is an easy one to grant so that I can help change minds. That may not be and your if, goal. So that yeah. go ahead. If it turns out we're wrong, like for example, I'm not, I'm not even saying that he necessarily existed. Mm -hmm. I'm just, I, for any given claim, um, I tend to look at it as, is this, does this have a burden of proof that can be met or has been met? And I don't think the, I don't think the, here's the problem. I don't think you have to go to Jesus is a myth to demonstrate that Christianity has a problem because it's, it is, and I've said this probably a hundred times over the years. Uh, it is absolutely, from my perspective, undeniable that Christianity cannot confirm anything attributed to Jesus. Nothing from his life, nothing, no words that he ever said. They cannot even confirm that he necessarily existed. And that is already problem enough. It isn't, it isn't strategically wise to shift the burden of proof to I, Jesus is a myth and I, you know, I can prove it. Because if you, if you follow the arguments, there are fallacies in all of them in that you know, people say the absence of evidence is an evidence of absence. Oh, no, no, yes, it is. The absence of evidence for a claim where evidence will be expected is evidence for or evidence against that claim. It isn't confirmation that the claim is false. And when the, when the mythicists are, are going around saying, hey, Jesus was a myth, I prefer to say there are definitely, almost undeniably, myths about Jesus. But whether everything about Jesus is myth, I have no way to demonstrate that. And it's almost up there with claiming that you falsified the unfalsifiable. Now, the nice thing is that at least a mythicist position is in principle falsifiable because Jesus could show up any second and falsify it ab instantaneously. And so I think they're on pretty safe footing. And if it turns out that, uh, that you know, people spend their lives thinking that Jesus wasn't real, um, when he may have, so that either, either Jesus wasn't real, in which case the mythicist will be right, Jesus was real, but not God, in which case nobody will ever know. We're not going to get any new information about it, and his existence is, is, is not an issue. Or Jesus was, in fact, actually uh, real. The stories about, it are, are true, about him are true, and he's God, in which case, uh, why isn't he down here settling this? But anyway, yeah, that's a, that's and, a long way around like to explain guys, why I'm not a mythicist. You guys make really good points, and I, I see your point now because like, if I think of Santa Claus, like he was a real guy. He was Saint Nick, all right? So he was like exactly. Saint Nick. And then somehow he morphed into this thing. So he was just your random like Saint guy, whatever. And now he's this this thing in, in Walmart. So I get it. Like that's that's actually, those are really good points. I mean, I yeah, I guess I'm just such a, a disbeliever in all the crazy magic stuff that it's just hard for me to grasp that he was even a real guy. But your, your points are well taken. I, I appreciate it. Thanks. Sounds good, Ryan. All right. Cheers. Yep. We have, unless a, th unless a theist calls in uh, while we're on this next call, we have one more call uh, right now to, to take. And we're, we're not going to be taking any more calls from atheists. But, wow, excuse me. If you're a theist, you can still call in. We, we will, I'll make time. If you, call, if you call in during this call with Russ, uh, we will take your call. Uh, otherwise, if that doesn't happen, Russ in uh, yes, in, Russ, are you in Montana? Yeah, I am. You I you call called in last night, night to talk and... about consciousness and religion, and there was a problem with the call audio, so I hope everything's back. Yeah. So let me try it this way, Russ. Welcome to Cause I Wanna on the line. Uh, it's so exciting to be with you guys and help. Maybe maybe this will help the audience even a little bit. Um, Many scientists, we hear them uh, say that we, we know uh, in the brain where uh, our uh, uh, spots are that lend to 
our spirituality. We seem to have this spirituality factor, and they can't quite put their finger on where it comes from. And um, consciousness uh, is really where it's all at. It's consciousness is a evolutionary probe. Humans seem to be the first ones with it that we know. Uh, the reason for it is to give a better uh, description or advantage to the brain to handle the world. With that uh, package comes a self that's automatic. And uh, with that self, uh, we call it me or I, what have you, we can uh, do qualitative comparisons. Uh, we can do predictions and uh, we can do observations and we can glean many things from that. One of the things uh, that's very, very basic, keep it simple, stupid, is what I say to this. It's very basic to us. And that is, we see all around us beauty. We see the deer, the little fawn get to be a big doe or what have you, get to old age. We see the rose go to a bloom, a zenith, and deteriorate. And we know one thing about us compared to them is they had a start, and evidently so did we. And that would follow that we've got an end, and that isn't, we don't like that. that. I don't know that there could be someone who is just so depressed that they want out, or that they're just so, uh, maybe a brain could be such that uh, there was no pleasure. But for the most part, everybody wants to live. They like this living thing. And they don't like the idea of dying. And what happens is we are all set up for it. And let's say someone comes around, if we lived in a vacuum until we were old enough, but we don't. And they put their arm around us and said, man, I feel your pain. I went through the same thing. I know a man that can help. Come with me. Now, for them to go into some kind of belief, there's got to be a payoff. Now, that payoff could be another life. It could be a better life now. It could be something as simple as just camaraderie, uh, socializing with other people. And depending on how bad you want this life or you don't want to do this die thing and just be it, that's it, that's the end of it, uh, you're pretty susceptible to buy into things. And my estimation is a, it's about that simple. And if you were to take a Christian or any 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 religion, and you say to them, oh, let's just guess that there's 3,000 gods right now, currently. Well, we know one thing. Everybody that believes in each one of those gods, and forever and ever, as long as they've been around, somebody's been trying to prove them. Nobody's ever proved them. So you'd say to someone of one religion, what do you think about that religion? And you'd say, well, that's made up. You mean you don't think that god exists? No, no, I don't. Well, then the book, read this book, man, that book looks like it was put out by some kind of divine thought. I mean, come on. Look how it got morals in there. It's got, I mean, it's got everything. Who the heck could have thought of something like that? It had to be a god. Well, no, not that one. And so, Russ, is there a question in here somewhere? Yeah. No, actually, it's what I'm trying to, what my, my question, well, I'm just trying to point something out here that this is how it gets set up. For, you're, so you're, um, you're essentially trying to make the 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 point that ha has been made by philosophers and sociologists for thousands of years that religion tends to be somehow involved with fear of death. Humans invent invent uh, religions out of their fears. Is that the point? Well, uh, out of uh, yes, I mean yes, I would suppose. Okay, that I have a I'm question then. I, I have a question. Yes. Certainly. How do you show that your explanation for religion is the correct one rather than some competing explanation, including that there is actually a God? I'm not challenging that. I'm setting it up to try to show people that the reason they believe is maybe so simple they don't even realize it, that they've gone off that edge. 
and they pick these things up that people say. I'm not saying that, uh, you no, know, no. that, uh, so I, you're, you're that. talking, just, you are talking about Russ, you are talking about, here's what you look at and you've put together a really lengthy uh, assessment that could be summarized as, Hey, I'd like people to recognize that there's a good likelihood that religions are invented out of fear and ignorance of human beings and that there's no good reason to think that any of them are true that would have been really easy but what i asked is how do you demonstrate that that explanation of yours is the correct one or the most likely correct one rather than some other explanation including that there is a god um well because i think uh, we all experience the self and um that's it, not it, an answer, um, Russ. When I say, okay. how do you show your explanation is the <laughs> likely correct one, to say we all experience self is to say something that has absolutely nothing to do with the question I just asked. Okay, I, I guess maybe what I... Uh, I <laughs> um, certainly this is my opinion. I'm not going to find what I've just said in a book. But it, You're not it, defining uh, the way I... I have a, if I have wow. a conversation with an individual about, I apologize, Matt. I don't mean to talk over you. I certainly it, didn't. Would you? No, like to it, it, it's sorry. fine. I'm not allowed to tell you to shut up anyway. Um, I and I wouldn't <laughs> because you're not talking over me. There's just a gap in this right here. It's the the point here is that yes, you have what seems to be a a, a conclusion that countless people have come to that since no God has seemingly stepped in to demonstrate that it exists, uh, it's a reasonable inference that human beings, out of their fears and their sense of self and their desire to want to keep living, and plenty of other things, their desire to not be alone, their desire for value, their desire for uh, answers to yeah. questions they don't have, um, all of those things are one collection of potential explanations for how religions came to be. But there are other potential explanations as well which um, maybe it's more about fears maybe it's more about desires maybe it's about uh this sense of self maybe it's about needing to control people maybe it's about uh any, any number of different things or maybe it's because there is actually a god or some being or some um supernatural realm that we've just barely tapped into but don't have the ability to understand or grasp or or any of that yet and so that was why I formed mm -hmm. that question to say, how do you show that what your suggestion is correct or most likely correct? And if you don't have a way, that's well, fine. But it, okay. to call in and tell us, here's what I think human beings have done, that's cool, but that's it's nothing new there, and it's nothing we didn't know, and it's nothing that's going to convince anybody. You have to come up with a way to convince people. Mm -hmm. I just wonder if it doesn't reflect my personal like experience that, either. Um, so but, it's one of those, you know, problems there. Yeah, uh, certainly it is. This is my personal opinion, but everything you mentioned, fear and socialization and all those kind of things, those are motivations from the individual. And I, I leave that wide open that uh, uh, whatever motivations uh, you have, uh, so will your, you know, the, the appearance of your path and how you approach uh, believing or not believing, and and so forth. So, uh, I think that yeah, I was just trying to be real basic about it. Um, can I? Well, that's uh, kind of a tautology, isn't it, else? Russ? Like whatever their motivation for whatever the motivation for religion was, it was the motivation for religion is essentially the tautology you're giving us. Like mm -hmm. I'm not okay. again. I'm looking for I'm looking for how how this is helpful and useful. You you had suggested that this was maybe going to be useful for the listeners, so I'm trying to find yeah the kernel well, of usefulness the way here. I feel right, Paul. The way I feel that that would be useful is that uh, maybe they don't think about it like that. They got caught up in the net. They never had those those things to begin with because at two years old they had it pounded down their throat and they've never had a chance to uh, even consider it. And if they stop and consider it and ask why it is that I believe and and then take a look at all other religions and say, well, that God is made up, so the book that is written about it's got to be made up also, or, or at least made up by humans. 
and they don't say anything divine until they get to their own, and it just kind of snaps on them. That, so man, us accusing <laughs> us accusing people of this is us laying out for some like if you lay out for a believer that I am going to tell you believer why you believe and list these categories is an unhelpful thing as a former believer. What is the helpful thing is the theme of this show, which is what do you believe and why? And you ask that question and let them tell you why they believe it so that you can address that individual as a person. If we had people call up, theists call up, and and then Matt and I are just going to read their mind and tell them why they believe and list yeah. off a bunch of things that are good candidates maybe, but that's just like entirely unhelpful. And I, I'm sorry, Russ, yeah. that, that I'm seeming a little bit no, uh, not, an, annoyed with yeah, this, but, it's okay. but it's just, yeah. as a former believer, this would have been the least helpful thing that, a the, that an atheist could have done for me, was lay and out also, these kind of things. When, when we were hey, believers. Can I? Right, Russ. Can I make a, a call? Russ. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Hang yeah. on. When we were believers, yes, sir. if somebody would have said, hey, you believe because of fears, well, I'm pretty sure that Paul and I both would have said, no, we believe because of the inner witness of the Holy Spirit and the fact mm -hmm. that Jesus done a transformative work in our life, uh, that sort of thing. And he, he, while you may be in fact, you may in fact be correct as to the real reason, um, mm -hmm. people may not be able to tap into that or understand it. And certainly the, it's not going to be particularly compelling to them for the people who are in church, who think they are witnessing miracles, who think they are witnessing answered prayer uh, and all that. But I will say, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to end this call here, Russ, because something miraculous happened while you were talking. Oh, oh you got a theist, okay. <laughs> no, I got three oh. theist callers. And uh, oh, great. since we said we'd take them, maybe I want to get Maybe this started it. Let's see what happens. Thanks, Matt. Maybe. Thanks for the call, though, Russ. <laughs> I appreciate you guys. it. Thanks, Russ. All right. Let's see if we can get through uh, three theist three callers uh, in in a reasonable time. The first one is Sven from Washington, they, them, uh, who we previously had a conversation about a third option, but welcome to the Cause I Wanna, Sven. What have we got for us today? Hi, Matt. I guess I just want to follow up. Uh, I was deeply unprepared for that call, so I, I appreciate you working with me. Um, but you did make me realize that logically I would have to identify as um, a theist, even though on the call I ended up saying I don't believe in God. And that would be because, like, as a classical Platonist, I, I do believe in forms, and every abstract concept has a perfect form. And so I guess uh, the forms of the ar of human archetypes, whether those be 7, 12, or 13, I won't claim to know. I guess that what those archetypes would be in the realm of the form would have to be what a person would call a god, probably a polytheist. Does that make sense? I, I suppose. Um... I, I don't know I don't know what to say cuz I mean the the question I thought you were going to ask was something about whether or not there's a what the value is and and identifying as spiritual whatever but I didn't know or didn't recall that you were a platonist and so I think you're confused on a number of different aspects of reality um and while it's great that you you figured out there's no third option between uh A and not A uh yeah i what i don't know what it is that you're presenting yeah, if, you, if you would like to focus more on that uh i do apologize that was a follow-up to the call screener um so my pushback and i think we got confused is not that i don't want to be called um my pushback was that i do not like being called labeled a theist because i'm very anti-dogma i'm you know i start all progressive and secular sven? and uh, go ahead. sven is it possible to be a theist and have no dogma? Yes. Then why on earth would you object to being labeled a theist if it has nothing to do with dogma? I guess because the popular stigma of it is that it, it, it follows a, a theology, you know? A no, theist, a theist is merely, theist is the baseline. I'm convinced that some God exists. That's theist. It, there's, th that, that, doesn't include any dogma or any doctrine or any tenets or any beliefs or anything else. 
Theism is the baseline. I can see why, hey, I don't want to be called a Christian because Christian comes with this package of beliefs that people must accept. But theism doesn't come with a package of anything. So in the same way that you thought there was a third option, now you're objecting to being called a theist for reasons that have nothing to do with theism. Awesome. I really appreciate that. I think that I could then say, you know, I'm a theist, but don't have dogma instead of whereas before I would say I'm an atheist, but I'm spiritual. So cool. does, does that sound more so, aligned with what I believe? That would be more I got true. Two other th- I got two other theists I want to try to get to. Maybe we can dig in on Platonism some other day, but sorting out the theist no dogma thing is probably enough considering we're, we're starting to close to run past time. So thanks for calling, Sven. I appreciate the update. Thank you, Matt and Paul. Bye-bye. Thanks. All right. The fatal heart, pronouns he am in, uh, wait, I, I'm confused about which, which state you're in, fatal heart, because it, yeah, I, I, yeah, it was it's around, yeah, North Dakota, Minnesota. I travel oh, North lot. Dakota, Minnesota, sweet. Yeah. Um, you have some rebuttal to saying God is stupid, so. Yeah, hey, so, cool. yeah, so, yeah, if I can do it quickly. Um, so reasons, right, that if you read the scriptures, the reasons God does stuff is basically, kind of the title of the show because I want to, right? You get you get basically he does it for his glory and pleasure, right? I think over time it's been warped to this sort of people-pleasing feeding of like God loves you and he wants the best for your life and all this other stuff, which I don't necessarily disagree with, but I feel like you you have a lot of other scriptures that point to God as being someone who is the 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 originator and the one to whom everything is due. And when he gives his reasons for things, a lot of the times it's just himself. So like you don't get reasons of how he created the universe. You just get that he was the one that did it. And when when Job is going through all this, all these problems, God's answer to him is, what do I owe you? So there's this uh, respect that's been lost over time through apologetics, through people just kind of trying to belong, I feel where they don't paint God out to be as to be this respectable, like all entity that, that doesn't have to explain himself. He doesn't have to have good enough reasons to you to do things that, you know, um, sure. There's a love component through, through, through Jesus Christ and sacrificing of self and, and, and pain and stuff like that. But, you know, you have a God that created Lucifer, you have a God who knew what was going to happen and, this whole idea of him having to be this cuddly wuddly person you can accept is i feel disrespectful in a certain sense because if he's god he's god it's not going to change what you think of him isn't going to change who he is when you called what was the thesis statement running in your head that you thought Um, it would be interesting to matt and i so what you you said he was stupid right? Or you said that God would be stupid if his reasoning, and I feel like you're doing us a service by calling out the stupidity and reasoning of the apologetics people who are trying okay. to paint a God as... So we were assuming that on the benevolence, we were talking to a caller for whom on, on the benevolence was on the table. Well, uh, you seem it, to want to be taking, ta- you seem to want to take on the benevolence off the table, and I think you well, would agree that that is describing a different God, and therefore we would no longer be, we would they no longer be, I'm the well, we, the Bible. Bible. it's not in the Bible. Uh, but we were talking to someone, we, but we were talking to someone for whom that was a characteristics of the God they were describing. You describe a different God, a yeah. God who does not have on the benevolence. So we are able to call mm-hmm. the, the God with that extra property inconsistent right and then that thereby you know stupid because he'd be contradicting himself you've just described a different god and so that's yeah i think matt and i would both say we'll sort sort that out with the christian right like that's not up that's not affecting you you don't have to you don't have to apologize fatal heart it's it's so one of the things to try to follow is that when i'm constructing uh some sort of objection to a god I tend to make sure that I use some if statements. Now, I've already deleted the notes that I used for, uh, that I jotted down for that specific thing, but it's if a God exists and wants me to know that he exists, which is a common model. Right. And if that God is refusing to interact with me in such a way that it would compel me to know that he exists, 
then that God is in logical contradiction. His goals and what he could do, because God could reveal himself to me at any moment, presumably. So if there is a God who could reveal himself to me and who wants me to know that he exists, but who refuses to reveal himself to me in any identifiable way, that God is stupid, is basically what I'm saying. That there's there's a... It'd be like, say, you know, if, if I don't, you know, we, we did this whole thing about whether or not we should call people stupid, not for things like, uh, oh, I believe there's a God. But if if you were to say to me, hey, um, I really want to get this job, but uh, I'm not going to, I'm going to rub poop all over myself and wear a T-shirt and sandals uh, and have my handwritten resume uh ready to go for why I should be the new CEO of Twitter. Um, actually, I probably shouldn't have picked Twitter because I think that would make you a, a prime candidate to, to be a CEO of the job. But for some other job, if, if you wanted to be, you know, Pope, um, well, maybe I shouldn't have picked that one either. But in any case, there's something you could do where it would be in conflict, where your goals and what you're willing to do for it are in such conflict that it'd be stupid. And that's all I was yeah. saying with regard to God. I, and if God's yeah, got an yeah, issue yeah. with me calling him stupid, he should fucking talk to me because he hasn't. Right, right. Yeah, he should. Yeah, if he, if he, if he honestly has created you for grace and mercy, then you would expect yep. that he would reach out to you at some point and make sure, make at least sure that you, you know it. I mean, there's, there's, there's the issue of, you know, you know, destiny, and then there's also choice. And so you have, you have those things competing. And so it does seem sort of, you know, malicious in a sense, if he's, if he's not willing, willing to go so far as to do very simple things to make sure that you know him. So it, it's, even it's, if. I was just going to say, it's he, interesting you bring up destiny and choice because I've got one theistic caller left who wants to discuss free will and the subconscious mind. And I don't think we're going to have time for it, but I'm going to take it just to see uh, yeah, if we're on there because. Um, I, I don't, I don't, well, it's too much go to get into, but we we'll, talked about it a little bit today. Yeah. Go no, work was, on the Christians, fun. Fatal Heart. It's, it's, I, I am a Christian. It's just, I yeah, go work on them to get to, to agree with you. And then, then once you guys all agree, you can call in. Yeah. Well, once they have right, a model of God that I don't think is stupid, I want to call it stupid, but yeah. Anyway, thanks a bunch. Thank you. All right. Bye. All right. Last call before we get to super chats. And I hope that we can at least address this, maybe what we'll have to do. And so we've got uh, Andrew from Washington, pronouns are he, him. Uh, Andrew, you're on, because I want to hear on the line, and there's a chance that what you're wanting to discuss is going to be too big for us to get to at the end of the show. And if that's the case, then I'm going to recommend that you either uh, apply to be on InBoss to make a case for that or call into another show. But the mic is now yours. Okay. I'm just more curious. I don't really have an argument for like free will and against free will and for God. It's more of just your view of free will. Like first, I guess the first question would be, do you believe we have free will in some What kind of free will? So that's the the ability to make decisions. I'll save you a bunch of time. My personal YouTube channel is Sans Deity. It's there for part of the Atheist Debates Project. But I think if you go out and Google my name, you will find a discussion between myself and Rationality Rules, uh, where we had our discussion about, we seem to have will. How free it is, is debatable. Um, I am generally speaking a compatibilist a la Dan Dennett, that I don't think that free will and determinism are incompatible. but I definitely do not think that we have libertarian free will, the opportunity to have done something differently. My take on free will is more along the lines of free will is we want there to be the thing that we perceive as free will to be unshackled and untethered by forces beyond our control so that we can hold individuals responsible for the actions that they take, that it's not just all molecules in motion with hard determinism. That's the reason we want to care about free will. Whether or not we have free will is irrelevant. If my car breaks down, Mm -hmm. it's still that car that is broken and that car that I have to fix. And similarly, if I murder someone, I am still the agent who did that and that needs to be addressed. And so the responsibility, at least to some extent, until we find that it can extend further, stops with me. And so 
the example that I used when Sam Harris and I were, were uh, on uh, at, we did an event together and we were talking about free will is Sam could get up and jump off the stage and, and end up down the, by the front row of the audience of his own volition. Or I could throw Sam off the stage and he would land down there in front of the audience. And the difference between those two scenarios encompasses pretty much everything that we care about when we're talking about free will. Because we're not so much worried about our free will being curtailed by the physical laws of the universe, like I can't flap my wings and fly. We're worried about our apparent free will being overridden by some other agent acting to do so, you know, forcing someone to do something or preventing them from doing it. And so I don't think we have libertarian free will. I think we have a will. How free it is, is I, I don't know. And, and I don't know what Paul's take is, even though I think we may have discussed it once before. Uh, all I would say in terms of the, the end being the end of a call is, Andrew, I would encourage you, as I have done since examining these things more deeply, I would have probably defined free will as you were about to, and that is just the ability to make choices. Uh, that is an uninteresting question. We definitely do make choices. The interesting question is, could we potentially have made other choices all things being completely identical, including the temperature of the room and the, you know, the just everything being 100% identical, could we have made a different choice? So I would just encourage you to maybe uh, change the question you were asking and seek, uh, seek, that's a more interesting question and more relevant in all the ways that Matt was just describing. So that would be just my encouragement at the end. I wanted to continue the question just to add, can you blame someone if they're subconscious like if it was their subconscious mind that caused them to do something, would you still blame the person? I, I, I don't know how. So would I blame the person if it was their subconscious mind? I would blame their subconscious mind. Um, and because their subconscious mind is still part of that same thinking agent, then yes, it's part of that package as an individual. Um, but for example, if someone unloaded a weapon and killed a bunch of people, and it was because they had a tumor in their head that was pressing down and, and controlling this. Once the tumor's been removed, that person, there's no good reason to think that that person is still a risk. Until the tumor's removed, that person is still a risk. And so we should act accordingly. Hopefully that makes sense. But Like, should they be punished if it was because of their subconscious? I, I'm not, their conscious? I, I'm not. I'm not looking for punishment. I'm looking for holding the agents responsible and doing what we can to prevent that agent from harming anyone else and to potentially rehabilitate that agent so they won't harm somebody else. And so it's not punishment that I'm looking for. It's repair and an avoidance of recidivism. Yeah, neither matter. I are, are into, I don't think either of us are into punitive, you know, just a, purely punishment for the sake of punishment sake. So you have to, you have to describe what your punishment models are and what you're trying to achieve with them. Yeah. I'm it, it's, I, I you hold people responsible. Or Certainly, retributive. That's the way I'm. Yeah. The retributive is yeah. one of the other words I was worried. Yeah. Like if I, if I violate the law and I get a fine or I go to jail, uh, I don't view those as like punishment. It's like you did something bad. So we're going to make your life miserable for a while. It is about attempting to make amends for the actual harm or the potential harm. Because if I'm driving 120 miles an hour down uh, a crowded road, I'm putting other people's lives at risk. If there's no other person left on the planet, I get to do whatever the heck I want. There, if I'm the last person in the universe, there is no morality. Um, uh, because morality is about the interaction between people. Um, it's, you know, e even to the extent that you could say me harming myself could be immoral, only if there are other people who would potentially suffer from that. Like if I'm uh, a parent and my kids are dependent on me and I um, take my own life, um, I could view that as an immoral act because you're actively doing harm uh, to other people. But now we're into moral culpability and huge questions that right. may not have anything to do with free will. And so we have a different view on, on punishment. What I'd recommend, Andrew, mm -hmm. uh, since we are out of time, is uh, call in Wednesday night to the hang up or um, tomorrow night to um, uh, Dying Out Loud or next Sunday on the Sunday show. 
Okay, thank you. Thanks. And that's a good opportunity. We're getting ready to go to Super Chats right now. Uh, although I don't have the link for today, hon. If, if you want to give me that link where I can. Yep, my bad. I got to wrap up the call in studio stuff, but I will get yep, that to No you. worries. So announcing once again, tomorrow is Dying Out Loud with Dave Warnock uh, and Aaron Lewis at 6 p.m. Central. Uh, on Wednesday, I'll have Apostasy on The Hang Up. Um, and Thursday will be Katie and Dr. Ben on the Transatlantic Collins Show. The next next Sunday is myself and Jimmy. And then next Monday, Skep Talk will be John Gleason. I, I, John, if you're in there, I don't know if we, if we do we know who your guest is or it, it, when, we, when it says and no. special guest, is it because it's a secret or because we don't know yet? No, but, special guest has become an inside joke on the channel. That means we don't have the person lined up yet. And the chat seems to think that's quite funny. So I love it. It's great. I, I have a special guest book for the rest of the year. But, uh, all right. Here we go. I've got the list. Let me view the queue and we'll get on here. Five dollars from Blake Walker. Can Matt say stop talking or silence or be still or are synonyms disallowed to? What about uh, shut the F up? If so, easy bet to it. Um, well, I, we're done with calls, so unless right. Paul uh, decides to just be a complete dick <laughs> right now, I, I have nobody that I could realistically be likely to say it to. Um, I'm the last hope of losing you losing this bet, I guess. All right. I, I also heard back from the individual, um, and they're taking responsibility for the confusion. That's cool. I appreciate that. Uh, I've sent them the PayPal information, and hopefully... Uh, after these, this challenge and the bonus challenge is settled, John, hit me up, message me. We can have a discussion. If you don't want to call in to talk about, you know, um, what what people should or shouldn't do in engaging in these sorts of conversations, um, because not everybody has the same way to, uh, of going about it. On the other hand, point to somebody else who sat here for 19 years, um, listening to just individuals who will not have a good conversation, no matter how much you try. Uh, and I think maybe sometimes a shut up is, is warranted, but I could be wrong and I'm not to everybody's taste. Are we alternating? Sure. Go for it. $10 from elite trainer, Kenway. God told me that Matt would get through this stream without telling someone to shut up. Can't wait for Matt to prove God is real. Wow. Well done. This is uh, uh, on par with biblical prophecy, that one. It is, yeah. As soon as you demonstrate mm -hmm. that God actually told you that, then we would have the first example of a demonstration of God telling someone something and a demonstration that it came true. And then we would need uh, to repeat that. Right. Because until that, until we get repeated results, it's just an anomaly. Ten dollars from Russ settles, or Ross Ross settles. My apologies, Ross. Hey guys, Paul, I love your collaborations with Sir Seek Seek Sick. Sick. Is it Sir Sick? Yeah. Yep. The, f the fun and sarcastic side of atheism makes for a great community. They always right. have to pair me with someone who's a little edgier. <laughs> That's the way that goes. All right. Uh, Five dollars from Pibble Punk. Paul, why does your cartoon have messy hair when your hair IRL is so gorgeous? Well, this is um, multi a multi-phase question. <laughs> First of all, yeah, in my natural state, no, this isn't the way it is. I My hair has gotten uh, much better since two things. One is starting my live channel where I'm no longer a cartoon and then I actually start carrying it. Two, uh, I live with Shannon Q now and uh, she, you know, and people know that I know her. So I got to <laughs> try and up my game a little bit because, uh, yeah. you know, don't I? Yeah, you got to keep up appearances. In, exactly. Yeah. 1999 from the Justin. A true miracle would be the full resurrection of uh, Fergal Burgle Minergal Burgle. Also, thank you, Matt and Paul, for your help addressing faulty reasoning. It's helped me a lot. Thanks so much, Justin. Yeah, I, I get it. We, we don't mention Fergal Burgle Minergal Burgle a lot. I almost mentioned it uh, on yesterday's show because we were having a conversation, or Noah mentioned something about. Um, basically having 
uh, wanting to remove the labels when the labels got in the way and if and, and just call it something else and that's mm. one of two reasons why Fergal Burgle and Ergo Burgle was invented in the first place is to have a nonsensical statement um, but also to be a fill-in label for whatever it was you were discussing where a label got in the way but I was recently at a convention uh, and there were a number of people there who had never heard of flying spaghetti monster and mm. that both uh was both confused me but also delighted me it's just kind of you know these are these are just the kind of phrases that come in and out of popularity so that's the way like language goes or trends go uh five dollars from rpg dunks i'm excited about getting the puppo that one of the hosts found uh outside chained up i don't know what fysj is oh go yeah is that go fuck yourself jimmy is that what that yes. is Where'd the go go? It effed itself like Jimmy should. All right, cool. I don't, we'll pass that along to Jimmy. Yeah. yeah. It's so funny. I've got, I got to, I'll have to talk to Jimmy later, but I've got a bunch of stuff to do. Here we go. Uh, today's winner is John Kennel. I, I, I don't think any of you are likely to top him. You have some time left. We have several super chats mm. uh, left. If any of you really want to, um, uh and try to top john but john evidently did a matching uh contribution to uh us predictably uh beating out and winning the challenges from before so excellent use of the word stupid says john and i don't remember exactly what i said when that you, super that was came through. that came in right in when you were calling god stupid ah there we go yep well in that case, uh, I'm going to call God stupid more often. I, I'm trainable, just like a puppy. That's right. But thank you so much, John. I greatly appreciate it. It's huge, huge support to the network. By the way, uh, I am not the best person at asking, soliciting donations. Never have been. Uh, it was probably my weakest, one of my weakest, weaker points uh, when I ran the Atheist Community of Austin. Um, this network is a labor of love from a bunch of us, but it's also how people end up making their living. And your contributions allow people to devote time to doing shows, including, you know, Forrest doing six hour shows on Monday, which, you know, God damn, bro, leave them, leave them wanting a little bit more, but I, I, I just love it. And so uh, I, I, my Wednesdays are better because of the hang up. My Sundays are better because of the Sunday show. And today is better. I, I worked on rat stuff, but getting to hang out with Paul, getting to take questions from people and having people appreciate it enough to contribute both $5 and $500. Um, I, I don't have words. I, and, and I talk a lot uh, to really express how much we really appreciate how appreciated we are. So thank you. $5 from Clunk, Clunkenvar. Was hoping for coffee table talk, but I'm always happy to have more. Matt, go fuck yourself, Jimmy, and enjoy your vacation. Well, you know, I'm I was always hoping that the coffee table thing, like some of the others, would just fade away and we wouldn't need to talk about that anymore. But you guys keep it alive, and that's uh, the bane of my existence. Thank you. Hey, if a coffee table thing gets us another five dollars, I'm all in favor <laughs> of bringing it up. Five dollars to Dante Verona, Divine Silence, any ETA. Definitely want to hear more on that. Um I'm not sure what you're asking. Are, are, you, are you suggesting when is God going to break his divine silence or um, when I'm going to do a video on that? Or when people will shut up about divineness? I I'm not sure I follow I this time, Dante. Right. But yeah, yeah I, as, as long as you're not telling it's somebody to mm -hmm. on behalf of me. No. This one yours or mine. Fine. Go for it. Uh, 999 from Nitty. Well, hi, Nitty. Uh, may the apologetics empire remain as buried as the historical Jesus's body probably was and still is. Yes, thank you. The apologetics empire uh, has disappeared, and I'm pleased for that. That was that was a an official association a while back. Oh, I thought this was just a general thing because nothing was capitalized. It, I, it, I he may be he may be referring to the general enterprise, but there was actually legitimately a coalition, and that seems to have gone away. And I'm just as pleased about that. There are there are a few things, uh, both from the apologists and from the other atheists, that have gone away. That I am I'm pleased and happy are are no mm. longer a part of my, <laughs> my probably life. a long list. Yeah, 
4.99 from just me. I wish live comments stayed on screen for reviewing streams. Just a thought. So many good comments. Love you guys. Go fuck yourself, Jimmy. You bad motherfucker. LOL. Heart. Live comments stayed on screen for reviewing streams. I think maybe they're talking about like when you watch a Twitch stream and the live chat is actively on the screen. That's oh. Me. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. Oh. So what, what ends YouTube, up happening? Course, I, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just saying with YouTube, you definitely, the chat does, if you, re, if you do a rewatch, generally the chat will, will stay there and you can, you know, keep an eye on what, what both things are doing. So it is possible to do. Yep. There, Dante uh, added something in chat to clarify. So now, now I know that we're looking for a video on divine silence, which it's just another divine hiddenness thing. Um, but yeah, I, I think I basically did it today in a, in a little uh, quickie nutshell, but digging in a little more to explain it could be useful. It's not the videos that I'm doing tomorrow. Tomorrow um, is going to be a debate review and two others that I'm going to knock out to, to finish uh, the end of the month, but I'm going to keep them as a surprise until they're actually live because patrons get them first. And, you know, you should get something for being a patron. By the way, if you're not a patron, uh, go to patreon.com slash atheist debates. And for as little as $1 per video, which you can cap, by the way, I, some people were like, I don't like that Matt does it per video instead of per month. If you want to do $5 a month, then just, just do $5 per video and then cap the max at $5 and you're, you're done. And you can do that with $1 too. Uh, and I'll appreciate all of that as well. And since Matt's plugging, I'll just say I've got all kinds of divine hiddenness videos that you can go watch if you want to. So, yes. You know. And, and, and I might not be adding anything uh at all but we'll see we'll see 699 uh, so canadian in alleged dollars from jerry from jerry petica is yep. this i forget if it's yours or mine what could help atheists do more what could atheists do to help society be more accepting of atheists good question evidently spend less time telling people to shut up <laughs> as um is one of the potentials that some people i i think on, honestly just being out what we need is for people to know that the person who lives down the street who they never interact with who they consider to be a good neighbor is also a non-believer it, it is also you know it's think about it from I, I like to think about it from the standpoint of like the lgbt community how many people were opposed to gay marriage and lgbt equality until they had a family member come out until a niece and nephew, a son, uh, and until they met and interacted with someone. Because if you have to look someone you love in the eye and say something about you does not deserve my respect or, or basic human rights, and I'm going to stand in opposition to your happiness. As soon as you have to say that to someone, even if you don't have to verbalize it, you know that conversation can take place with no words at all. When you're saying, I'm going to actively work to suppress the rights that you want because I'm opposed to who you are as a person, that is a difficult thing to do. It's really, it's, it reminds me uh, of, of the analogy of, of the simplicity of guns. If people had to actually jab a knife into someone to kill them, it's less likely that they would have the wherewithal to do that standing there than they would if they just unloaded a gun uh, and poured out a bunch of bullets. And similarly, it's even easier to potentially, uh, although I'm glad it's not, it is potentially easier to drop a nuke. The more distant you are, the more removed you are from anything, the less it matters to you. And so make yourself matter. Make atheists matter to people. Make it so that, and, and, and do it, not just for the atheist community, make skepticism matter, make skeptics matter, make humanists matter, make the LGBT community matter, make it so that they can't say, I've never met an atheist who gave me a, an explanation for why they didn't believe. I've never met an atheist who was a good person. I've never met an atheist who could do this, 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 or this. Prove them wrong all the time. That's what you can do. Because when I no longer get calls from people who are absolutely confused about how we, we can not believe in god and instead are actually working to just 
to describe how and why they're still believing in a God. I, I don't know what more I could ask for. I want to be put out of a job. Good answer. If, if a bit long-winded. Is this with me? 499 from Don Wanderley. Satan had direct knowledge of God yet rebelled. Is this an indication of the illusion of free will? Well, is this an indication of the illusion of free will? Um, so I've used Satan as an example before for people when, when they say God won't reveal himself to you because if he did, you'd absolutely believe and that would violate your free will. Nothing about God revealing himself, to, if I have free will at all, nothing about God revealing himself is going to violate my free will. A God could reveal himself and I could still choose to whatever extent I can choose to rebel, and I use Satan as the example for that. So rather than Satan being an indication of the illusion of free will, I'd say that Satan in, in the story is an example of the reality of will independent of knowledge of God. Right, exactly. And you get the last Five, one. $5 from Larry Fishman. Uh, there are some great coffee tables for sale around Nova Scotia. Hashtag Team Shannon Q, hashtag Team Coffee Table. Yeah, and hopefully none of them make their way in here. But I'm sure there are some nice ones. They probably have clutter on them. Paul, what have you got coming up that people need to look out for? Mm, just, well, I, I've got some some great videos with some some scholars. We are going to be debunking. Uh, one, one I'm most excited about is there's a recent archaeological find that the Christian community had a lost their mind over and i am have doing a, a documentary on why they shouldn't and why it's terrible and that's coming up in a couple of weeks with dr kip davis and others so look forward to that one outstanding so thanks again so much uh for joining us today paul and i are happy that you you showed up and we're very happy for all the callers we've got as good callers i wish we'd have had more contentious theistic callers um, but all of our theistic callers today were um well, I guess Monday is when you when you go through and you're doing the the crossword puzzles in, in, from the New York Times, which we've Arden and I both started doing more often. Monday is easy day, and then it builds and kind of tests you throughout the week. And so maybe because today was Monday, um, they just followed that model and said, you know what, let's let's keep the light theistic callers. Don't forget about dying out loud with Dave Warnock and Aaron Lewis tomorrow, right here on same line channel, almost the same time. We will see you all. I will see you uh, on Wednesday on the Hang Up. But in the meantime, we do a show like Cause I Wanna. I, I, I like the fact that Jimmy did this because Hang Up is often more political with, with religion as a, as a tied primary. And the Sunday show is about religion. Uh, that's what we want most of the time. We are working to have more shows that address more parts of what it means to be a human being. Shows about sexuality, shows about parenting, shows about debates, shows about how do I deal and cope with life. We may be doing stuff related to political issues, healthcare, and as we gear up towards an election here in the United States, no offense to my Canadian brother, uh, mm -hmm. as we gear up towards an election in the United States, I guarantee you, you will be seeing a lot more political discussions on this channel from myself and Jimmy and other people as well. There's a lot, and it can be overwhelming. And I feel like a good chunk of the last seven years of my life has been alternating between justified outrage and, and catatonic shock between having Donald Trump as president, a, a global pandemic. Um, take a break when you need to care for yourself and make sure that you are in a state just like when you're on an airplane secure your mask before you secure the mask of the people around you if you're not taking care of you you can't be here to help us take care of other people as well trust me i do well at making sure that i have some downtime so that i come back to every single show we do here or almost every show optimistic enthusiastic and you guys have not never ever disappointed me by showing up rewarding that optimism and by pushing for good conversations that's why i wanna 
Hopefully, that's why you want to tune in. Please make sure you watch the rest of the shows on the line. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. There's that song. This song is like all the time when we're rapping.